Well, I appreciate everybody for being here this morning, especially the visitors that we have. We're always encouraged by your presence, and we ask that if you have any questions for us at all, then please let us know. We would love to be a guide, a help, a support to you in whatever you've got going on in your life. If you have any spiritual needs especially, please let us know. We'll open up our Bibles, we'll hold hands and pray together. Whatever it is that you need of a spiritual nature, we hope that we can be there for you. This has been a difficult time lately in Memphis. And, of course, we need, you know, we need to understand that uh, there's always difficulties, right? This is a world full of challenges, and just because something is suddenly happening in the news in our own backyard doesn't mean that it didn't happen the week before somewhere else in the world, and the week before somewhere else in the world, and the week before somewhere else in the world. Um, I don't think that it's an overstatement, though it is an incredible tragedy to say it, but every single day there are people hurting each other, there are people killing each other, there are people stealing, taking, lying, harming, that happens every day. This world is full of tragedies because it is a world so corrupt and impacted by the curse that began all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. And it really didn't take very long from Genesis 3 to Genesis chapter 4 for the very first murder to happen. And so I don't want to overstate anything or simply be a victim of the moment, but this has been a rough week for Memphis. We have had several tragedies of a particularly heinous and disgusting nature happen in our community that have shocked all of us and have left us, I think, wondering about this community. I don't want to say it's an existential crisis or anything like that, but you do ask yourself where and why and how am I going to feel safe in my own hometown, my own neighborhood, when things like this seem so random and so heinous. What I want to talk about just for this short time, because this is our second Sunday and we will dismiss at 9.30 for our group meetings, I just want to have just a short conversation with you about the treasures that can be found even in times of tragedy. The title is Nuggets in the Mud because where else do you find gold nuggets but in the mud? I mean, there's a reason why you have to pan for them. There's a reason why you have to dig for them. There's a reason why it takes so much effort to find them. You don't just find gold nuggets sitting neatly on the top of your grass in your backyard waiting to be found like Easter eggs. You got to work for them and you got to dig for them. And you got to get your hands dirty and you got to get dirt and grit under your fingernails. But if you try hard enough and you look long enough, you will find the gold nuggets in the mud. And so here in the midst of these tragedies, I want to remind us that even with carnage and chaos and violence that happens in our streets, there, there is still something to be found in these situations reminders that have incredible spiritual value to us, maybe something that we can hold on to in the midst of our emotional struggle to just remind us that there is gold to be found in these situations. I thought it was very appropriate, by the way, the songs that Adam selected this morning. We did not coordinate, by the way, but all three of those songs fit perfectly into what I want to talk about today. And I want to remind us of the third and fourth verses from the church's one foundation. And I'll go ahead and read them. The church's one foundation. Though with a scornful wonder men see her sore oppressed by schisms rent asunder by, her, by heresies distressed, yet saints their watch are keeping, their cry goes up how long, and soon the night of weeping shall be the morn of song. Mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war, she waits the consummation of peace forevermore. Till with the vision glorious, her longing eyes are blessed, and the great church victorious shall be the church at rest. And we long for that rest, but for now, we're in the mud. So it's time to get digging, and let's see what we can find. I want to look at four treasures, very briefly, that we can find in the midst of our tragedies. And these can be any kind of tragedy, not just the things that we've experienced in Memphis lately, but personal tragedies, family tragedies, a, a crisis of conscience or a crisis of identity. Four treasures that you can find in the midst of tragedy. The first treasure is this. The full range of human emotions 
provides surprising richness. Even the emotions that we typically think of as bad or negative emotions. Not all experiences are pleasant. Not all experiences are comforting. In fact, and I've said it before in other lessons, we have to come to grips with the reality that most of humanity for most of human history has lived under horrible conditions. Like, we take it so for granted that we can turn the tap and have clean water. We take it for granted that we can have a home that is the exact temperature that we want it to be. We take it for granted that we can go to the store and that we always have food available to us on our shelves. And we forget that for like, and I'm just throwing this out there for hyperbole's sake, for 99% of people who have ever lived, in 99% of human history, it has been squalor and starvation and disease and a high infant mortality rate. That's what most of humanity has had to live with. And so, we need to find sobriety and peace and wisdom even in the bad emotional experiences because that's what most people have experienced and are experiencing. If you think that life is always going to be pleasant and comfortable, you're in for a rude awakening, like tomorrow, right? Not going to take very long for you to realize that life is full of sorrows and pains. Take a couple of passages, for example. In Ecclesiastes 7, the writing of a man who certainly understood the full breadth of experiences in his own lifetime. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, the writer says, A good name is better than a good ointment, and the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting, because that is the end of every man, and the living takes it to heart. Sorrow, he says, is better than laughter, for when a face is sad... A heart may be happy. Verse 4, the mind of the wise is in the house of mourning, while the mind of fools is in the house of pleasure. Now this gets read a lot of times at funerals, but it's something that we ought to take to heart every single day. That as far as wisdom is concerned, as far as two different experiences that make you who you are, that, that help you grow, he says, it's better to go to the house of mourning. It's better to experience sorrow than laughter. Because sorrow, though it is painful, is an incredibly enriching emotion. It's painful, but it's enriching spiritually, wisdom-wise, emotionally. Take another passage. In Acts chapter 5, in the midst of what could I think technically be called a tragedy... In Acts chapter 5, in the first few verses there, there's this story of these two individuals, Ananias and Sapphira, who sell a piece of property for a certain amount of money, and then they claim that they sold it for a certain amount of money and donate it to the church. What they're essentially doing is they're, they're lying. You know, for the sake of just throwing a number out there, we sold a piece of property for $10,000, but let's go ahead and say we sold it for $5,000 and we'll keep the other five for ourselves. Here, $5,000 to the church at Jerusalem, a generous donation by Ananias and Sapphira. They're called out for that lie, though, and they're struck dead by God. Now, you might think that an experience like that would just, like, knock the church down. The church at Jerusalem would just go, wow, that was, what a discouraging week this has been. Just a, it's just bad news here at the church in Jerusalem. People are falling over. They're getting struck dead by God like flies. I just don't, I don't know if I want to be a part of this church anymore. A lot of negative stuff going on at the church in Jerusalem. And yet, look at what happens in verse 11. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. And if you keep reading beginning in verses 12 and onward, the church kept growing. Great fear. Even in the midst of what by all accounts is a horrible situation, a negative situation, great fear came upon that church and they kept working and they kept growing. Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes, Jesus reminds us here in these Beatitudes that, you know, 
what appears on the outside is not always what's going on on the inside. Most of the Beatitudes talk about situations that we would normally consider to be not good. These are not blessings. And yet here's Jesus saying, blessed are the, he uses words like poor and mourning and lowly and hungering and thirsting uh, and persecuted and insulted. He uses words like that to say you're blessed. If you experience this, deep, thoughtful, engaged people don't linger forever in ease, but they wade through the hardships to find the treasures. A fourth treasure, and at this pace, we're probably going to have to cut this off here in a few minutes because I've only got a few minutes here on these second Sundays. A second treasure, appreciating your mortality is never a bad thing. We don't wish tragedy upon anybody, especially our loved ones or our neighbors. But when tragedy does strike, I say don't waste the opportunity to consider life's brevity. Psalm 39, for example, reminds us, surely every man at his best is a mere breath. And so he asks God, teach me to be aware of my brevity. Teach me to number my days. Let me know, he says in Psalm 39, how transient I am in this life. Other passages also remind us of this. James chapter 4 says that you're just a vapor. You're a breath. That's what your life is. A third treasure. When tragedy strikes, I'm reminded that a worse fate awaits me if I don't repent. Our scripture reading a few minutes ago was drawn from Luke chapter 13. And there in Luke chapter 13, Jesus actually talks about several tragic experiences that were, you could say, in the news, right? These are things that were happening kind of on a local level. These were on people's minds. He reminds them of this story uh, in the news of Pilate killing some Galileans and mixing their blood with sacrifices. I mean, surely that's that's a horrible and disgusting event. You'd hate to read a headline like that. And then on top of that, he says, and then there was this tower in Siloam that fell over tragically, and it killed these people. And he says, were, were any of these people worse sinners than you? Were any of these people worse sinners than the survivors? No, of course they weren't. Tragedy happens, and tragedy hits us very randomly. What's the difference between the person who gets carjacked and killed at the gas station and the person a block away who has no idea that any of that happened? Well, there is no difference in terms of were they innocent, were they guilty? There's no difference between them. They're not worse sinners or better sinners. Or It's just tragedy. And it strikes. And it's random. But Jesus does say there's a lesson for you, though. There's a worse fate than getting killed in a car wreck. There's a worse fate than getting held up at a convenience store. There's a worse fate than getting struck by a vehicle while you're out there minding your own business, walking down the sidewalk. There is something worse waiting for you than all those things if you do not, pair, if you do not repent. And God's patience doesn't last forever either. The very next story that he offers in Luke 13 is a little parable about a man who comes to his garden and he looks out and the trees are producing, well, at least one tree is producing nothing. And he tells his gardener, rip that tree up. I'm sick and tired of that tree. It's just taking up space. It's not producing anything. And the gardener says, well, let's, let's give it one more season and I'll take care of it and I'll water it and fertilize it. And, and let's see, let's see if it produces anything next season. And if not, then we'll dig it up. The lesson is, yes, God is patient, but God's not patient forever. And if you don't repent, there's something worse waiting for you than whatever tragedy happens to be in the news today. And a fourth treasure to take away from tragedy when it strikes is, I am never lacking opportunity to spread the good news and to shine my light because as dark as this world is, the gospel of Jesus Christ and my influence and my good deeds that are molded and shaped by the example of Jesus are so much brighter. 
Now, while we should never come across as religious ambulance chasers, I do think tragedy has a way of prying doors open to people's hearts. We're all just one tragedy away from facing our own demise. As long as we're here, though, we can help. We can heal. We can teach. We can love. And just as Paul explains in Philippians chapter 1, when he says, I'm hard-pressed. I'm hard-pressed. I don't know which one to choose. If I was to die, I could be with Jesus, and all my labors are over, and it would be rest, and I would really, really like to be with Jesus. But I know that if I remain on them in the flesh, it's good work to be done. And I'm hard-pressed from both directions, but I suppose that if I'm going to stay here, that I'm going to keep working, and that's our mission right now. You and I did not die in a tragedy this last week. You and I did not die in a tragedy this week. But we can keep living and doing something about the brokenness in our community, the brokenness in our families, the brokenness in our neighbors' lives. We have an opportunity to do something about that and to show the love of Christ and to teach the gospel to people and to be an influence on people. And that's a gold nugget in the mud right there. You better pick it up and do something with it then. Let's pray together at this time and then we'll be dismissed to our group meetings. Let's pray. Our wonderful God in heaven, we are so thankful for this beautiful day. We are so thankful for all of our blessings. But it's hard to look past the news when the news has so much sadness in it. It's hard to look past the tragedy when the tragedy strikes so close to home. So help us to be lights. Help us to be salt, to be different, to be distinctive in our behavior and our attitudes and the words that we use. Help us to preach your gospel, unadulterated, pure and simple. Help us to tell people that they need to believe in your son and to be baptized in your name, in your son's name, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Help us to show people what it means to have lives free from sin, forgiven, filled with grace, changed and reborn. Help us to say the right thing when the opportunity comes up and to not shirk our responsibility to be bold preachers of your word. And God, we do ask specifically for families that have been impacted by these latest tragedies in Memphis. Please bring healing and comfort to them. And if it is your will, grant them the time and the grace that they need to prioritize you in their own lives. Help them to seek after you in your word, to speak to others about where their faith is lacking, that they may come to a greater knowledge of you. Be with all of these families and help them to move forward in life, to know that there is always something to be done. God, be with our police officers. Please bless them with safety and wisdom and good sense as they encounter difficult and trying situations. Be with our mayor and our other elected officials, both on the city level as well as the county. Please be with first responders. Give them the cool heads that are needed to respond in the right way to various tragedies and situations and that they may use rightly the life-saving skills that they've worked so hard to hone. Continue to be with us as a church. Bring your blessings upon us, all the rich spiritual blessings found in Jesus alone. And in him we pray, amen.